What is up, everybody? We are back, the Vanishing Mediators, with another banger. Last episode, it was only the duo, the dyad signifiers, and now we have Tres Leches with us. So, <laughs> free beer tomorrow, aka Nick. The so, Tercionis, we'll... what was yes. that word we learned today? Tercionis <laughs> something. Latin yeah, phrase. <laughs> the three bodies, three body problem. <laughs> with the con- contiguity thing. Or, oh, like, ter- Tercionis something. Something like that, yeah. <laughs> Anyway, we're back at it again. Last time we went over chapters 12 and 13 back to back in one episode. And today we're sticking to 14 only. Um, the signifier as such signifies nothing. And today I will lead off with a short presentation. Just kind of keep it short, simple, and sweet so that we have time for a discussion and flush out the entire lecture itself. So, to kind of recap what we've been going over, and I want to rewind and recount from 10 all the way up to now, because this is crucial where Lacan is really emphasizing the notion of the signifier for the first time and going in depth. So when we look at chapters 10 all the way up to now, especially 10, we get into the territory of understanding what is at odds with Schraber. And it is the lack of the oscillation of presence and absence, dealing with a fundamental deadlock in his delusional system, which comes about from this resigned abandonment of not knowing why the world is the way it is, but that God wants him to restore it by being his wife, right? By being God's lover. And yet at the same time, he runs the risk of even losing himself because in order to do that, he must come to union with God, but then his entire reality would be destroyed. And also the fact of if he is uncertain about the reality, but he knows God wants him, but also what comes into question is, God's ability to know Schraber's freedom before he even knows it, because he has no idea of the mortal world and also puts into question if God has the ability to foretell uh, a lottery game. And so this is where Lacan focuses on the fluctuation from Schraber's delusions to the intrusion of verbal hallucinations. How this happens is because of the signifier. And so We understand that the signifier is a differential network and it has nothing to do with phenomenon itself. And he leads into this by saying that when we look at a symbolic order, it is an oscillation of presence and absence or the pluses and minuses. He will then elaborate on this in lecture 11 where he talks about the the day and night scenario. Day and night are not to be confused with presence and absence or plus and minus. What the contradiction or opposition of presence and absence or plus and minus is, is that a signifier's own contradiction is its nihilation process, which creates its absence. And so the opposite of night is not day. The opposite of night is not night and its own absence. And the contrary would be day in which dwells in the absence of night or within not night. So this is a crucial thing for Lacan to evoke what would be the fundamental structure of the signifier. He even says, The human being poses the day as such and thereby becomes presence of the day against the background that is uh, a background of concrete nighttime, but of a possible absence, daytime where the night dwells and vice versa. 
And then fast forward, we get into understand more about this. In Max's lecture, he talked about there's a distinction between a natural sign. Um, he talks about what was it, the red robin, right? And it's yeah. red chest, which has a sort of natural indication to it. We have a smoke, or which is going to be the sign, and it refers to fire. Then we have a trace in which we may have footsteps, but the referent is not fully present, but it indicates something that is there. Um, and we could see it as maybe, as Max put out, ash, which, though there isn't a fire, indicates that a fire was there. But then the signifier doesn't have a referent. It has an absence and must be replaced by another signifier. So the signifier relates to another signifier to relate for the absence. And so going back to 10, we realize that he says in terms of meaning that the signifier gets meaning by referring to other signifiers. But the key thing is to realize that when it comes to the signifier, where the ego psychologist, any forms of Freudian revisionary get wrong is that, well, maybe they don't have the notion of the signifier, but they're focusing on language. They're focused too much on trying to identify meaning in the transference and symptoms don't have meaning. A symptom, which is signifier, is only a representative of something that has no meaning at all. It is a standstill for something that is absent, right? So to clear that out of the way, now we get into what is at stake in this seminar. And that is the signifier as such signifies nothing. So Lacan starts the seminar by talking about structure. The structure in psychoanalysis we're talking about a group of elements forming a set, right? This structure shouldn't be seen as totality. And as we're savvy readers of Lacan, we realize in later Lacan that we're dealing with an incompleteness, we're dealing with a symbolic order that is not fully whole, but is incomplete. But for now, we just get the fact that structure is not the same as totality. So we're dealing with sets, not totality. He kind of gets us confused a bit by talking about the distinction between open set and closed set and this notion that these groups of elements in structure are forming a covariant set. And so to dumb it down, what it's dealing with is, is a structure that has certain variables and probable outcomes, which would be the way that the signifiers play within this uh, relation of synchrony and diacrity, the way that the signifiers can fluctuate in terms of relating and meaning, and how they transform over time, not just historical time, but maybe we could think about sort of temporality, time where there's understanding, where the subject understands. But not to get too lost into that, the point is that with covariancy, with this probability, with this variable type structure, we're dealing with signifiers or a, a, a set or a theory which doesn't rely on correspondence nor correlation to anything. And right here, this is where Lacan will start to talk about science, especially physics. And he brings up uh, a hermetic German mystic named Jakob Burma, who says, if the signifier as such signified something, well, this is what it would be like. It would be in uh, Mr. Burma's um, text called Signatura Rerum, in which there is a God that signifies everything in the natural world. We could even look at someone like Henry Cornelius Agrippa, whose system of se semiotics and signs or stones um, or plants or elements correspond to certain angels, certain um, gods, certain 
energies, et cetera, in which there is a one-to-one -one correspondence or that these signs have natural meaning ascribed to them because they signify something. And he says, well, this is the sort of mystical physics, right? And then there's the physics, which has no need for someone to signify anything because it uses this term natural phenomenon. And in the natural world, there's nobody to signify anything. What's interesting about physics and to kind of take it back and kind of leave the seminar for a bit, physics is always interested in the natural world, in the nature of reality, and yet isn't out there in nature. It isn't trying to discover the atom within the natural world in the forest or in the plains or whatever. No, it's on a chalkboard creating mathematical formulas, creating models. Look at Mr. Einstein, as Lacan will say, with his E equals MC squared. And this is the beauty of Lacan because this is where he's getting it towards the notion of the signifier or you think of the letter. E equals MC squared, if I were to show it to anybody who didn't know science, right? Obviously, it's the most popular thing now, so we kind of can have some meaning to it. But when it first came out, or just like any physical model, they don't mean anything. They're literally just pure writing. That's the deception of physics. Thinks it's dealing with a natural phenomenon. It is dealing with pure writing. And so we have to ascribe natural values to them. In the same way, later Lacan will come up with his formulas of sexuation in which they mean nothing. So we must ascribe sexual value to them to see how these things play out. And so for the physicist, they ascribe natural meaning or natural phenomenon to a writing that means nothing at all. And so Lacan pretty much is telling us that, you know, all these sciences, whether it's the birth of modern science and physics, or even the mystical sort of physics, or the physics of antiquity, are dealing with some type of writing, dealing with some type of notion of the signifier, though it's not fully present. And in meta, it's not dealing with the signifier itself like psychoanalysis is. And for the antiquity, we're dealing with a model that is ascribed because of mathematics. Nature is harmonious. Nature has mathematical rhythms and tones and octaves to it. Look at Pythagoras, look at Plato. And for even the Platonists, Aristotelians, etc., even the skeptics, the Ciceroians, it doesn't matter. Even if they disagree on, you know, sort of metaphysics or models, they could agree about logos. And so logos is what makes the world go round. There is a harmony to it, right? And even someone like Aristotle, you know, father of logic, couldn't see past that or see past, you know, his, his natural theory, his metaphysics to develop something like the signifier because he was stuck in his own naturalism. Take a quote from Mazaros, Istvan Mazaros, the Hungarian Marxist, who said he couldn't have a notion of freedom or have a notion of alienation because he didn't have a theory of historical development of the concept, right? The Greeks didn't have a notion of history or historical development like someone like Hegel would, or even Augustine, for the lack of a better term. Augustine is the father of history in the sense that we would see about it. But in the Christian sense, he's looking at, we're going towards the end of times of eschatological, soteriological significance. But for Aristotle, he couldn't have a notion of freedom as such because it was rooted in his naturalism of freedom by nature, slave by nature. And so these are examples of how these certain aspects of antiquity, when we look at physics and stuff, or even the mathematical models, always kind of relate in a Euclidean sense. But at the same time, they can't see past the way that their form of, of nature or understanding nature works because it's all mathematical harmony. It's not to say that it's completely collapsed into one, but 
their situation of mathematics is far different than the birth of the Kokito, in which for the first time we get radical doubt on a god that could deceive us. This is what Lacan says, the birth of physics, or at least the foundation and bedrock of physics, cannot sort of escape. It must wrestle with the fact that in order to move forward, they must have someone that could deceive them. Hence, this was Descartes' first sort of thing that this, I see the wax melting and it's no longer a candle, right? Things are constantly changing. How do I know I'm not being deceived by a demon, right? Or, or a God. And then he goes through his problem of method to discover that even if he's doubting everything, he can't doubt the fact that he's thinking or that he is certain that he's doubting. So we get this fluctuation of certainty and doubting. Well, what does this have to do? Well, Lacan then talks about doubt and talks about sort of these historical, uh, these notions that have sort of historical significance that didn't pop into thin air, like notions of society or nation, right? And even if we doubt the significance of what it means, it's the more that we doubt the content of it, its meaning, the more that it becomes a signifier because it is nothing but pure writing. And what is the title of this lecture? What is Lacan saying? That the signifier signifies nothing. The signifier is pure writing down and nothing more, right? And this is where Lacan will then talk about, well, let's look at this concept of subject and object, objectivity. They're not contraries at all, right? Not a contradiction in the way that, you know, classical and even classical philosophy um, or even science would say, because science wants to get rid of the subject and look at the objective facts, the facts speak themselves, the natural world. And even if it can't find a truth, it invents a truth with writing like physics. And so Lacan points out is that with psychoanalysis, we realize that, well, no, the subjective is not on the level of the speaker. The subjective is not on the level of me who speaks. It's in the objective. It's in the real, right? To me, and what he'll say is he makes a distinction between the subjective and then the subject, right? To me, the subjective is going to be of what is of the unconscious, and what is, as you'll say, I think at the end of seminar or the, the end of this seminar, uh, uh, chapter, end of chapter 10 of this seminar, where he talks about, I've now led you to the problem that is at the heart of this. And that is between the subjectivized uh, structure of repression and foreclosure, the way that we localize these two things. This to me is the subjective that comes out in the real, right? Whether we're talking about repression or we're talking about foreclosure, very, very fun. But the subject who's also at the level of the unconscious is the one that plays with signifiers. The signifier that makes us doubt, but the signifier that deceives us, that is like Descartes' God, right? This we could see is we're thinking about the relationship between S as subject and the big other. The big other is the one that plays with signifiers that writes down. But they don't mean anything. They're just, and this is why it can be deceptive because you would think that when these things come out that it's relaying meaning because when we look at, again, the schema L model, we would look at sort of network where a message is relayed, just like Lacan's example in seminar two of the telegram circuit, where A sends a message to B, to C, to D, to E, to relay it all the way back to the beginning. In that seminar two, we talk about machines, we talk about circuits, communication circuits. The main point is feedback. So then he goes on to talk about, well, 
let's talk about communication. Uh, you know, can we see that the signifier is really about communication? Meaning, but no, because even today in science, we would like to talk about like how we have neuron receptors which send signal to certain parts of the body to communicate a response, but that's not the signifier. That's not the subject. It's not the subjective at all. That's no point indicates subjectivity. Or his example of um, the uh, receptor that goes from a certain organ to another part of the body in response to hormones, right? That's not communication in the way of we're talking about with what the signifier is doing, which is not communication in the sense of how I'm communicating this lecture. It's more of just pure writing down. But what the signifier really is doing in this network that's different from these biological receptors or um, what is the machine that he mentions, Nick, in the as an example? Is it a, is it a thermo elect electric a thermo electric machine? machine which yeah. gives feedback responses. Still, even though we have a circuit of A to B, A, B, C, no matter how broad the circuit, there's always going to be a feedback. But that's not where the signifier lies. The signifier lies in accounting for the circuit total. And so the example, like it's like it's not about the fact that I want a pack of Yu-Gi-Oh cards. So I go to the store and I give them person money and they give me the thing. It all doesn't matter if it's not written down with a receipt, $7.99. What is $7.99? $7.99, it's number, it's a price, but what does that mean on its own? doesn't mean anything, right? But what it does is it accounts for that exchange relation. So what the signifier does is in the circuit of exchange, in the circuit of communication and feedback, what the signifier does is it accounts for it and writes down, not to relay meaning, but just to mark it down. And he brings up this example of, say, I'm on a ship, I'm on a captain, I'm a, I'm a captain on the ship and it's dark and I try to look for signs, right? I try to look out anywhere. And he says, if I am uh, not a human, I'm an animal and I'm encountering this experience, I would do what an animal does and make all these emotional responses, uh, motor uh, motor responses, et cetera, right? Something of, of pure uh, feedback and extinctual stuff. But what a captain does um, you know, if, I, if I'm a human, is that I mark down the time, point, longitude, and latitude, not to relate any meaning at all, but just to mark this down. And I love this example because, I mean, being in the Navy, there's always a logbook when you're on a watch, you mark down the time. 0700, security watch reported all conditions normal. 0800, Reveille, bell rang. 0815, quarters. They don't mean anything. They are just pure writing down. It's only in the interaction of all the sailors on the ship that when they adhere to this writing, that then meaning could get inscribed, right? And so this is what he's getting at, is that when we're looking at the signifier, we're, lot, we're not looking at the level of meaning, right? We're not getting caught into the imaginarized version of the symbolic, right? We're looking at it on a formal level of orders of operations in which we have just pure plays of signs, pure plays of signifiers that refer to nothing but other signifiers because they mean nothing. There is no referent to them, right? So now that we got that out of the way, what does this signifier, this this signifier that means nothing, really relate to what we've been talking about? And that's with, um, you know, Judge Schraber, right? And this is going to tell us to get back at the heart of the problem. What Schraber is dealing with 
in his psychosis, what Lacan wants to make uh, punctual is that of um, foreclosure or, repre- or rejection, verifung. And so he wants to talk about how, well, in this mechanism, it's the signifier that is rejected and comes back into the real, right? In these verbal hallucinations. And it's at this level of looking at the way the signifier functions, or lack of a better term, doesn't function for Schreiber, but reappears. It's different from what, again, this, uh, I believe is a psychiatrist, maybe some type of psychoanalyst, uh, Caton, um, observes more of a phenomenological um, supposition of the case. And we sh- it's not really philosophical phenomenology, uh, phenomenology like, say, Heidegger, Merleau-Ponty, Sartre. If anything, if we are looking at a phenomenological sense of psychology or certain forms of therapy, it's not focused so much on how, you know, going back to the things as they are or a fundamental ontology of Heidegger or, um, you know, the sort of uh, being for itself of Sartre, freedom, rather it's on the way that symptoms and these phenomenon are full of meaning or are in a state of meaningfulness. I mean, let's look at the beginning of the seminar where he criticizes uh, Carl Jasper for um, notions of madness and understanding um, and, you know, sort of categories of, of intelligence and, and depth, right, from Slightly, I guess you could call it existential, but it's still phenomenological in the sense that he ascribes a meaningfulness to all these symptoms. <clears throat> but that's not what Lacan sees is at heart with the psychotic, psychotic, because then you kind of confuse what could be potentially a neurotic for a psychotic based upon ascribing meaningful connotations or categories to such phenomena. And so he says, there's something interesting, right? Or there's nothing that is more closely like that resembles a neurotic sim- symptomology or symptomatology than a pre-psychotic symptomatology, meaning that both neurotics and pre-psychotics have similar uh, symptoms. And in a sense, they're almost structured the same. There is a difference. The difference is how they relate to the other and the other that plays with the signifier. Right. So even listing down the pre-psychotic stage, right? Uh Lacan talks about Katon, or at least Lacan talks about, you know, in this this case study with uh the commentary of uh Katon that um, you know, we're analyzing all the stuff that's perplexing in Schraber. Um he is prey to strange foreboding, um, and then uh images that invade his mind or in a confused state um, is fixated on what it would like to be, you know, subdued to intercourse by God, or even what is at stake as being God's fiance, right? But really these pretty delusional, but also are in the realm of pre-psychotic symptoms, because it's not to say that neurotics can't have delusions. They definitely can. I mean, even Wolfman had hallucinations, right? But the, these aren't any, I mean, Dora as well. Dora had, you know, delusions as well, but it didn't mean that she was psychotic, but it resembles something of the pre-psychotic. But on the more structural level, on the level of the signifier, and this is where we get to the heart of the problem for Schraber and dealing with the other. We talk about another case study that, uh, Katen is dealing with with a boy who, you know, subjected to psychosis, but in his pre-psychotic state or pre-psychotic development, um, as he was going to puberty, started masturbating a lot, but then uh, renounced it under a, an injunction by his friend. Um, and Lacan points out that what he would do then is identify with this person. And that's the key kind of imitates the imaginarized uh, relationship with this uh, friend. 
And he says right here that he behaved as if he were at the mercy of a severe father. And he would try to, you know, imitate everything of being in a journey of self-conquest and try to uh, like the same girl that this guy did. And hopefully this girl would be ready to fall into his arms. But really, it's after, you know, these this he leaves this friend or whatever that we get the onset of psychotic symptoms. But really, as Lacan points out, what would have, you know, made this not possible since we're talking about puberty, and though puberty isn't the stage necessarily for Oedipus complex to um, start, usually around that time or prior, we have the introduction of Oedipus, and it's not during the start of puberty, it's usually during puberty or to the end of puberty that Oedipus complex is resolved in the classical Freudian sense. But he did not have this, so he's dealing with a sort of paternal image rather than what, what Lacan would call the name of the father or the signifier that introduces itself into the neurotic and which is the introduction of sexuality, right? This has nothing to do with something meaningful like someone like Michael Ballant would say, that for Oedipus and this resolution of sexuality, it would lead to something called genital love, which is something where love or the sexuality and the sexual instinct is sublimated into a moralization of love to be able to aim at harmony and equanimity in society, but also toward a loving and caring object, which would typically be like, you know, rather than the sort of primitive sexual instincts I aim at courtship or I aim at marriage. That's the sort of conservative way to think about how balanced mindset or balanced theory of genital love is, but that's not what Oedipus is or Lacan. has everything to do in the last chapter with this notion of not only the signifier, but how this symbol, the phallus, structures two paths for the boy and the girl and their identification within the symbolic order. We talked about that in the last uh, episode, so I won't go too uh, much in depth with that, but that is what Oedipus is in a nutshell and how we see the play of the signifier of the name of the father, which stops this imaginary identification and interpolates one and alienates one more into the sort of symbolic uh, codes of sex. But what's interesting about the psychotic and these forms of identification still is on the level of what is at stake with the subject, and that's of defense, right? Without the signifier, we don't have the defense proper that Lacan is saying and Freud is saying. So we have these identifications to keep the psychotic foreclosure at bay. And when foreclosure happens, then well, for someone like Schraber, we have this rivalry, uh, or not even rivalry, this fear of persecution by the father. And the key thing for the psychotic breakdown for this other patient was that he had hallucinations that the other wanted to rob him and castrate him. And so this structure is at the level of the initiative of the other, the other that plays with the signifier, as I said in the beginning, but the other that plays with the signifier for the psychotic wants to castrate, wants to do something, to harm, to rob, to take away. And this doesn't happen for the neurotic because the name of the father comes in and repression takes course. So there is a forgetting of how even the signifier was introduced to begin with. But the defense of the subject and the signifier is one of inmixing with the subjects. I'm jumping around a lot, but pretty much we're getting to the end of my sort of ramble on um, this lecture. But this inmixing is important because this is how the other, which is the subject, the unconscious, this big O, 
relating to ES or on the L schema S subject subjective is demonstrated in Freud's dream of Irma's injection, right? We have the inmixing of subjects, but who is the subjective, right? It's the dreamer of Freud. The dreamer is the one that dreams and creates these defenses. A Freud um, handling Irma says that she's in pain, her throat hurts, and then the inmixing of subjects happens in this defense where uh, Otto and all the other two um, colleagues of Freud start to observe, and bicker, and stand right there and argue about what is wrong, right? But meanwhile, this is not, you know, the signifier that comes in by the other. And so who is the other, right? Who is the other of Freud? Well, the other Freud, at least it's never really certain who it is, but we just know that the other dreamer introduces the signifier, which is trimethylamine, which is the syringe that has the chemical formula trimethylamine that is injected into Irma. And we see it in the conclusion of the dream. The conclusion of the dream where the signifier is able, upon feedback, to recount for the cause of the dream, which is nothing more than a chemical formula. All that is, is the fact that for Freud, as Lacan says, it's nothing more for an effect in a formula of organic chemistry, right? This question of this formula it's also the question of Freud's dream, and the question of the cure, and the question regarding psychoanalysis. So the signifier pretty much has no meaning. It signifies nothing. So what is questioned is the signifier itself. That was a nice ending. You're muted. Nick. Oh, I'm muted. Good stuff. Really good stuff. I wrote down a few different notes on what you said, which could be points of departure. The signifier as such, and I think an example of it as a stark sort of fear of the effects of the signifier in Karatani, and I hope I'm not misremembering this example, and when I say in Karatani, in trans critique, he talks about the Manhattan Project and how I believe, if I'm not mistaken, they assume that the Germans had already themselves discovered the atom bomb and how to put it together so it wasn't so much the fact that the experiment was being carried out that was kept secret it was the fact that they had published the formula itself and that's what was kept secret because what is the formula it's writing yeah it's writing it's the signifier and it's the signifier as such that needs to be hidden from the other in this example. And these aren't Lacanians doing it. These are scientists. Right. Oppenheimer, just one, right? Did it win Best Picture? I think it did. Win all the Oscars, yeah. It won all the Oscars. So it's like they knew at least at the level of their intuition that the signifier has a certain potency which outruns the content to to which it refers right and isn't it also funny that you mentioned that example because doesn't einstein regret even 
making public or discovering, you know, the, the theory of E equals MC squared because it led to the atomic bomb. Right. And we know that, as Lacan says in this lecture, those are just meaningless yeah. signifiers, formulae. And he says these formulae, the order of operations that they represent, they have all the more power because they mean nothing. So to point out the fact that language can be interpreted in many ways, that language changes over time, is not uh, an effective critique of Lacan's theory of linguistics. It isn't puncturing it in the sense that well, yeah, language changes over time. Yeah. Language doesn't have a one-to-one -one correspondence with a referent in every case. And you don't need to be a philosopher or Lacanian or interested in Saussure or psychoanalysis to realize that. You just need to use language and see all the multifarious applications that a word has. But the point is, by no means is the letter itself at all castrated right through that realization and if there's anything that in a sense would qualify as perhaps almost like uncastrated in the the baromian setup we're working in it's almost like the letter mm -hmm. that might be a little going a little too far but it's like there, there's a, a an irreducibility to these elements that yeah, though they can be arbitrarily like divided up, you know, he says at one point in an earlier lecture that to divide up language the way we do, whether morphemically or like phonetically, is just as arbitrary as any other division where a word ends, where it begins. But these tiny elements which we could think of as material yeah they're material yeah, insofar yeah. as they're structural and they together form minimal coordinates and the minimal coordinates themselves are just the signifier and that's mm -hmm. a structure and i wonder if also and this is wasn't what i was originally thinking but when he talks about the open set as opposed to the closed set having kind of circularity I wonder if that has to do with, remember, I think, was it in your presentation, Max, where you have night and day and they're in this sort of vicious circle? Yeah, right? you know where, what I was asking myself is, is he that's saying the circularity there are closed about. sets and there are open sets? Or is he saying that structure in general is not a totality? Yeah, structure itself is not a totality. It has to do with sets. So even if you have yeah. like, and so I was looking up a bit of like covariance theory and, and the different sets of open and closed, even if there is like two different sets, one that's open and closed, and I still don't understand like, well, I know like it doesn't matter. Like sets are just comprised of elements, whether they're like letters or numbers. And being open is the fact that I think that even if it forms a circle, there's still like a sort of room in which more can be added right versus the close there's like a sort of definite point of, yeah. of, of of order of operation uh and i think it's with real numbers that uh you know a set remains closed but in a sense we could get i guess the two where there's a common common denominator where i think that they could intersect right and i don't know if that's the case for mathematics or set theory in a sense, but like how I think Lacan is using it, and this could set up for metaphor and metonymy in which two different signifiers then intersect into one and metaphorically, uh, you know, set replaces for an absence and metonymically makes up the entire network system. Right. That would yeah. be the covariability, I think, because it's exactly. like- Exactly, exactly. And I thought about this for a while the variability of all of these elements that make up the set have a 
almost regularity to it, I think, is that they they vary in relation to one another, but they aren't correlated. Yeah, they're not correlated. Correlation would mean signifier and signified. Mm -hmm. But this is where and correspondence would be that like it like adheres to natural phenomenon or something that like of an mm -hmm. object, like, like the sig signatura rerum, you know, these these signifiers are written down by God in the natural world. Which is why I mean you would think that okay, to understand Lacan's gloss on Saucerian Saucerian linguistics, that we would need to privilege um diachrony over synchrony but really i think max you were talking about earlier today the two are one in the same in the sense that once yeah. when we get these historical shifts that mix up signifiers and link and relink them in terms of their various connotations we also get a change to the synchrony of the signifying system. And if you look at statistics and points plotted on an X and Y axis, those coordinates, I just remember in one of the videos about covariability, you see all of the different coordinates yeah. switch places. So it's like, I guess what I mean by that is the historical shifts that occur in language over time which ultimately rearrange, shake up signifiers, right? Have a synchronic effect, at least, especially in the imaginary realm where we experience language as a totality. We assume it's a totality thanks to the phallic yeah. container and the name of the father, but the shifts themselves um are temporal yeah and, yeah, and i also yeah. think that you could if you could view it like through a horizontal and a vertical relation of signify and signified so for so sure like there's pretty much just this vertical relation and this is completely isolated from the horizontal relation uh like the change over time completely isolated from the vertical relation of signifier to signified, but for Lacan, I think like the horizontal relation of, of time of metonymy is necessary so you can have metaphor. Mm -hmm. Right. So first you have to have day, then night comes in to give day the meaning of not day becomes then night. Yeah. Right? And it and so it and it diachrony yeah. follows from synchrony. Mm -hmm. And it makes, me, it makes me think with these historical shifts, like going to like what uh, uh, Gabriel Tupanamba does in his presentation of like uh, the history of the big other and um, using a uh, logic of worlds, which is a form of set theory uh, of Badu and um, the different structures of exchange and modes of exchange in Karatani's structural world history that you have like the sort of ways in which different structural shifts in different, you know, epochs in society transform, but yet, you know, somehow uh, there may be some similarities, but differences come about. And for example, like the structure of capital exchange and crises coming about only in this sort of type C model. But nevertheless, like my example is using is like kind of like when you look at like how there's like a historical shift from Greek society to Roman society, it's like, there is a shift in which like we go from like sort of like participatory democracy into a sort of uh republic in which yes slaves still exist as property but it, it's property that makes you an individual and that's the difference in roman society but yet there is sort of these new ways that signifiers of representation and personhood come about and yet sort of something still remains from the old society that's preserved. And then we lose that. We get into like the feudal ages where it's like, well, now there's mm. still that hierarchy, right? Now we have feudal society and it's about like the landlord or land owner or the king. And so rather than having just really slaves, you have serfs. And then we go into capital, right? 
And the one thing about capital is that what makes it a problem, which was never a problem in other societies, even though they had markets and commodities. So the problem is the commodity here in capitalism that is highlighted based upon the sort of historical and structural shifts of synchrony and diachrony. Yeah. And the I residues... That... Sorry. No, go ahead, Max. Okay, I just wanted to say that I think this this beginning part of like this chapter is so confusing and completely throws you off balance because mm. like before he gave a much more simpler definition of structure. Yeah. And that's in chapter 11 where he says the structure appears in what can be called the phenomenon in the strict sense of the term, and then a few sentences later, from the point of view that guides us, we don't have this a priori confidence in the phenomenon mm -hmm. for the simple reason that our way of proceeding is scientific and that it's the starting point of modern science not to trust the phenomenon. Right? Yeah, yeah. So I think structure is much more simpler defined as you look at the signifiers in the sense that they don't have phenomenological quality, right? As you yeah. I would say. And you look at them as pure signifiers. Right. In, in structure. And, and it's because what makes phenomenology different from modern science, and we could look at uh Husserl's um, you know, entire methodology is not only back to the things themselves, but also um the way that it presents itself, and he's getting this from Brentano to, you know, subject subject in question and he believes that there's a crisis in european sciences because they focus so much on objectivity and all these formalities that it's killing the, re the rest of the humanities because it lacks one thing the human subject and so that's the difference between studying the phenomenon which you are sort of doubting or feel like deceives you versus uh studying the way that things present themselves to you in so far that you're a subject that can bracket out and comprehend, or at least make methods of understanding, um, bracket out intuition, or bracket out all these things that we can't know and only go with the a priori, right? You know, that's that's what phenomenology is in the business of versus the scientists. And, he, and I think he means it. I don't I wouldn't want to say that he means science simply. I think he's being in technical in so far that he wants to say that psychoanalysis is kind of like a science but just I'm not yeah. not 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 in the way that you know the natural science is right yeah he, a, he says like the question he opens it this this chapter with I feel is like I don't feel like he actually does it like what's the difference between natural science and the science that psychoanalysis belongs to which is also not the human sciences right yeah the answer is the subjective is for us that which distinguishes the field of science in which psychoanalysis is grounded from the entire field of physics. It's the instance of subjectivity as present in the real. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the main thing because it's like it's like this sort of secret third, right? Beyond the uh the the human sciences, which privilege notions of society, uh social facts of like someone like Emil Durkheim. And then, like, you know, the list goes on and on, social constructionism. And then the natural science, which privileges natural phenomenon and uh, disregards any form of the subjective or consciousness that may get in the way. It's a sort of neutral, passive observer. If, but right. you know, what, what confuses me so much is what that actually means. Like, because yeah. I, can, I can think of two things that it could refer to in this chapter. And the first thing is he's saying, okay, physics is observing the pure signifier, like the natural laws and so on. Yeah. Um, they don't have meaning, but then he says, well, still it has meaning at the limit. Mm -hmm. And I think he's referencing um, these signifiers that physics relies on. Like physics implies the minimal conjunction of two signifiers, one and all, right? So is he basically saying, okay, psychoanalysis is also a science, but it also doubts the fundamentals that science is based yeah. on? Yeah, yeah, yes. So and especially because, well, we got one because we're dealing with one world in totality and all because of all the knowledge and facts about this that we could possibly acquire uh, counting. And 
what psychoanalysis does is it puts this notion of one and all into question. And how does that do that? With sexuality, mm-hmm. right? That man wants to be one, right? To have the phallus and be one. And the woman wants to be all for the barred other, right? And that's different right. from the mystical physics. And you know, the example I thought of immediately was like what's called sacred geometry, right? It's exactly that you like you go into nature and you see like a sunflower and it's like, oh my God, it has this pattern. There's this secret logic to the world, the secret geom- geometry that has a meaning. Yeah, right? the Fibonacci spiral and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> no, life, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But okay, so physics looks at the pure signifiers that don't have any meaning, but secretly relies on some meaning. That's what's yeah. kind of hidden. And mystical physics, everything has a meaning, but yeah. psychoanalysis is is questioning, even putting into doubt the signifiers that physics relies on. Mm-hmm. But then, like, he kind of says that, okay, what is the subjective? Mm-hmm. It's another subject out there in the real being able to utilize signifiers to kind of lie by telling the truth. Yeah. Utilize signifiers not to be significant but to signify i think is the wording right yeah and that immediately makes you think of intersubjectivity well so well this is i think this is where we get discourse because this, this is where i'm starting to think that discourse and science for lacan are synonymous because if discourse is the count of what there is through the structural coordinates a count and I mean a space count and an account of all of the objects that can be accounted for uh, within a certain domain, then psychoanalysis is that science which is going to, in some ways, interrogate its own conditions of possibility continually, meaning this assumption that other discourses rest on that the universe is one and that all is one yeah is an assumption that psychoanalysis as a science cannot take for granted Mm -hmm. so what does that mean science psychoanalysis as something that aspires to this ideal of science, and this is Milner, is going to, in some ways, track what ultimately undermines discourse, I think what subverts discourse, and what is that but the unconscious? Yeah. because So whereas nothing, there's no other discourse that would in any way attach any value to slips, bungled actions, or just the impossibility of speech in certain instances other than psychoanalysis because these are manifestations of the unconscious in the sense that they don't allow the assumption of discourse to play out towards this all that science is yeah, yeah, yeah. aiming for. I don't know if that makes any sense. Yeah. All the other discourses rely on some kind of outside Right? Yeah. That's kind of the idea. An umwelt. This is yeah, the umwelt. It, it, yes. Ah, that's umwelt. Okay. I think yeah. that's the umwelt. Because yeah. the umwelt is, it's what these discourses are aiming at is to count the universe as one. 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 And they're pitching their own approach, their own methodology as the best way to count the yeah. universe as one and to therefore yeah. solve the question of right. one's own sexuality and one's own enjoyment psychoanalysis doesn't make that promise it doesn't no and it's 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 uh counting the universe as one and all the ways of 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 knowing and and collecting all the facts well that that that's the all right you know knowledge it seems like rests on the all and and the world itself or reality which is supposed to be the object of the science you know counts as one and so psychoanalysis is like questioning well how did you get from zero to one right and so never we can never really understand how we get from one and so 
you know, with psychoanalysis, as Max pointed out in the last presentation, is focused on this minus one, right? This sort of negative, this non-knowledge, right? And one of the things that in in your guys' like dialogue that I also came up with with what Max was talking about, about the, you know, mystical physics or just like modern physics, but even just science itself, it's like what what psychoanalysis does as far as neither being a uh, natural science nor human science, like the secret third does though, is create mathematical topologies, right? And showing how they fail and how they don't correspond to any natural reality, don't correlate to anything. It's showing how pure writing has always been the basis of all of discourse a discourse of mastery of something which is nothing but a truth production of enjoyment, right? And that what psychoanalysis is doing in investigating pure writing is undermining that, right? Yeah, and that's... that's and that's, that's with that's... sex, right? Because look at what's pure writing now, you know? Chat GPT or all these like sort of mm. like, uh, um, you know, what, what they call those metalinguistic uh, models that like, you know, the that AI could do. And I think I've said this before. It's like <clears throat> they could do all these cool things uh, and, and they could mean so many inputs and outputs to create different programs. But try having it right, the sexual relation. And it, it will give you something that is resembling to biological chromosomes of XX and XY. Or it would give you some type of yin yang thing it's impossible to write about sex. And that is also the question concerning the structure of, you know, hysteria is, am I a man or a woman, you know? Am I capable of, you know, being somebody who could reproduce or, or uh, in society? Or um, what he even talks about in this chapter of like with the, the, you know, the neurotic, it's like the question of birth. Why was I born? Or am I going to die soon or am I dead? Birth and death cannot be explained by the signifier, but they can write it. Even if I were to die, right? And we wrote down the cause of my death. It still doesn't, the signifier still doesn't explain it. It just simply writes it down, right? What is explained by the cause I'm of sure my about death. It. It's what I really don't like the, the reference to death it, it, in the, because it's so confusing. Because It's confusing, but here's the thing. So the cause of my death isn't explained by the signifier. It's explained by whatever form of medicine it is, right? But on the existential level, right, the existential value of life and death cannot be explained by the signifier. But that makes you fall immediately into phenomenology. You know, that's what I'm thinking. But, not, but I not don't necessarily think it's phenomen phenomenological. No, no, no. You know, because because I, I can imagine someone reading it and being like, oh my God, death is so traumatic. It cannot be put but, into words. But, but I don't this, think that's what he's, he's this getting. Is, this is, no, and I'm not trying to say this. This is what yeah. I'm getting out about the signifier is that the signifier can't, you know, write down anything that has a signified for death. But what the signifier does, and this is the very Hegelian thing, look at sense certainty, is that it preserves the thing and allows the thing to die. So, of course, really, I die. But... The signifier of my name is still preserved and everything that comes with it, right? This is the whole point of negation and what he writes in the entire essay in the Acree uh, on Hippolyte's commentary of negation. That it has been noted down. Before. Yeah, we, we could know? we could say that the signifier puts respect. Yeah, on my name. It put respect. <laughs> yeah, it, it's Birdman. It's Birdman. But <laughs> the signifier allows the thing to remain present in its absence and allows yeah. it to that. and that's the main thing well what's the between two deaths also if you think about this well, there's a place in the symbolic order set for you before you're even born which mm -hmm. means in a sense that's also death before you yeah. exist there's a place for you in the signifying order. that's why he says you're immortalized by the signifier yes. and in that way you're beyond death and then you are already dead. Yeah. Are, in some sense, and almost inert. In and, and, and to put it simply, it's like before you're born, it's like, you know, you, you don't know the reason why your parents had sex to have you to begin with. But 
when you know you're in the, the womb it's like they're already fantasizing of where what kind of clothes they're gonna get you where your room's gonna be at oh are they gonna be like me are they gonna be like you uh what do you think like you know they're gonna do all these things are already signifier placeholders for you before you're even born so you already have a spot in life and also the possibility of having you know a spot in death if, if, if i'm reading that right but main thing is what you're saying it's like yeah even before you're born you are already inscribed into the symbolic um metabolic rift pretty much and that is wanna... as much death as we could consider post-mortem death to be death i think that's also what he means <laughs> by by death is that there's an inertia that the signifier introduces through just the naming of a person yeah, yeah i think that's what he's saying directly that yeah in this chain of noting down the signifier cannot be destroyed so your yes, name exactly is still there exactly you... and he said and he really says the more that you try to like ascribe some sort of like um what does he say like real life experiences the more that we realize we can't but therefore the signifier remains indestructible especially with this expression piece of the evening right we don't know what way it relates to the to you know evening if there's an actual piece to it with the fact that what is absent is the sort of stressful horrendous day that allows for this signifier piece of the evening to come about and really again just to say like it had like when i we were talking about the life and death thing it has nothing to do with phenomenological yeah. you know uh, understanding this existential value is the fact that it has a value of being and not being simply i mean that's for the simple neurotic the obsessional neurotic who's oscillation oscillating between being and non-being his subjectivity is a reflexive one that creates this presence and absence of being and non-being because he can't make a choice right i mean this is hamlet 101 right here this is even the sort of uh who else who else is it pretty much that that is what the obsessional is that this it's in this fixed point of of not making a choice and therefore unconsciously makes the choice from its willingness to be and, and you could and you could say that the whole metonymic chain of signifiers is that passage from being to not being and it's as if hamlet saying to be or not to be for the other for the capital s subject which is equivalent to the question what am i for the other not yeah. so much can I ever resolve my own sexual hangups in an everyday sense or can I ever feel fulfilled? That might be a part of it, but it's more so can I ever capture the metonymic sort of evanescence of one signifier giving way to another, the contiguity that we were talking about before, the analogy, the vanishing mediator between analogies and the contiguity that accounts for, like, let's say, the part standing for the whole, that is something that we can never capture. The phallus itself is that false promise of trying to, in some sense, contain right. that passage yeah. from being to non-being. And this question of sexuality is also always a question of what am I for the other? Now, for the neurotic, they uh, uh, unsuccessfully attempt to cope with this situation through the development of symptoms. Yeah. The symptom is, of course, we're talking about the registration of signs, right? The captain who writes down the longitude and latitude, even if that recording in the log has no relevance to anything at any time in the future there is almost like a pacification there and the fact that i recorded the fact i recorded the actuality of the sign mm -hmm. there's the act of recording the actuality yeah. of the sign which leads to the signifier the symptom though is of course what cannot really right be acknowledged as recorded but it is all the more registered in that sense and it comes out through the involuntary yeah right and, and, yeah but that relates to the modern universe like perfectly what we, we were talking about before that 
psychoanalysis, psychoanalytic science is different than physics because physics, as he says, relies on some kind of context that's outside of physics. So he says like these two signifiers, one and all, you would be wrong to think that these signifiers belong to science. Right? So science can only operate in the universe that is one and all by having an outside that, that makes it whole, right? Whereas psychoanalysis as a science is based on doubting everything. So there is no outside. Mm -hmm. And that like leads to this irresolvable problem of the non-all, right? Or the modern universe that also Mirnea talks about that always struggles with its outer border that cannot exist, um, which then the symptom solves that kind of, or like is a patch on this irresolvable exactly. problem. Exactly. And he says that hysteria is a question centered on a signifier that remains enigmatic as to its meaning. There's yeah. always one signifier that is enigmatic and that patches that. And this modern universe has the topology that you said before. Okay. But the return of the repressed is the repressed. Yeah. yeah. In the sense that as soon as we focus on the symptom, which only psychoanalysis can focus on the symptom, we find the obstacle to the articulation itself yeah. in the symptom. And I can attest to this because I undergo psychoanalysis whenever you're at a loss for words or whenever the analyst poses a question to you and they, my analyst doesn't tend to ask that many questions as much as he does kind of rephrase or rearrange the signifiers that I give him. But sometimes he asks a, a pressing question at an opportune moment that's when you're taken off guard and silence or saying, I don't know, or just being completely yeah. baffled in that moment is the only quote unquote appropriate response. The only thing you're capable of mustering. And that right there is the gap, the semiotic gap, which comes where that's it accepted. It. Yeah. That's the yeah. So it has a place in your world. Yeah. Because what, what is it? That it they has a place in your world. If the obstacle yeah. itself is suddenly recognized as such. Exactly. This because is the signifier. Because what is, is psychoanalysis doing, right, in 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 this moment, and, and let's go back to schema L. If it is the big other capital O that plays with the signifiers on and sending this message towards uh subject as S, right? Id and all its way of formulating the signifiers, and then you see the how it interacts with the um other as as uh you know little other and then ego well, we have this imaginary wall of language and so analysis goal is to break this imaginary wall of language and and the psychoanalyst is situating himself in the placeholder of the big other so that way they could bring forth the uh unconscious for you so it's like what they're doing is acting as a space for the unconscious to play itself out this big other is playing these you know enigmatic signifiers that take you off guard right and this is how we see the relation between the subjective and the subject which have a huge objectivity an objectivity in the real and and this is what he's trying to show with with all this that in his schema l this is what analysis does analysis is bringing about symptoms of the unconscious that are being played you know, played yourself. So it's the it's it's the big other that is doing this to the subjective, which is the subject as S. And right? this is why the message you receive it back in inverted form. In inverted Piazza form. says in subjectivity and otherness that there's he sees two meanings of this inversion. There's the everyday imaginary meaning of everyday, you know, social intercourse where you say something. And you don't do. hear yeah. the effect of it. You don't, it doesn't come back to you because it's inverted in the sense that what's unconscious in it becomes conscious. And whoever you're interacting with, whether they have a negative or positive reaction, reinforces what you said and gives it 
a the imaginary effect of a signified. Whereas there's a further inversion that happens in psychoanalysis where when you're expecting something to be volleyed back to you in its signification as significant, it's inverted back into a signifier. So yeah. you're kind of hit in the face by a signifier as such. Mm, and you become yeah. aware of sort of it just the way a word even sounds, right? Or it's it, it's still an imaginary element, but suddenly it's convex. You know, it yeah. sticks out that, to you. That's really good. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. It's like the way it, it, the message is inverted, which you would think would have significance, it becomes a signifier because you have no way to respond back in a significant or meaningful way because it doesn't, um, you know, entertain your imaginary register of understanding. Rather, you can't understand it. You don't know how to understand or even respond. It's so alien to you, but that is what the unconscious is. It's that sort of alien foreign discourse, which is uncanny, but also all too familiar. But the sentence that he's, he's saying here, like uh, what differentiates psychoanalysis from physics, the subjective appears in the real insofar as it implies that we have opposite us a subject capable of using the signifier uh, in the sense that they lie through yeah. using the signifier. They are deceptive. So is that basically saying, okay, physics has an other outside that's super minimal. Maybe it only has two signifiers, but we can rely on this other. Whereas psychoanalysis like views this other outside as something that is deceiving us. Can, can I break in real quick? Just because yeah. I really like the way he puts it though. Cause he says not just that uh, the signifier deceives, but it deceives us over what there is to be signified, which is yeah. interesting. Cause that is, if a discourse is a count of all the objects that, that belong within, let's say, a specific set under a heading, then one wonders, is there anything left out? Is there anything unaccounted for? And of course, there's always a dot, dot, dot of what's unaccounted for. And I think even his use of deceiving is deceptive in the sense, not to, like necessarily trying to connive and and trick but rather deceiving in that like is that all there is to say about this is there anything left over yeah. there's always a, a, a remainder now i i don't know if that's how you guys read it but that's just what i heard in there well it, it is pretty I'm already interpreting and, a little bit i am kind of asking you guys about because well, the super naive way to look at it would be yeah, um, in psychoanalysis, I don't know, we have true intersubjectivity with other people and we feel our trauma or something. There's a, a subject yeah, no, but that's the thing. Well, well, the thing he says, well, intersubject intersubjectivity is where we could see meaning interplay, but on the level of the the subject, which is the other, and I said this earlier, the capital O, that is the one that's playing with the signifiers that can lie to us. Not lie to us because they're trying to lie, but in the fact that the signifier print, uh presents itself in this plane of signifiers is that you know it's not relaying anything meaningful the signifier comes up and it, it appears as a lie because of the way that i guess it takes itself into account i mean look at like lacan's whole thing about the subject that lies to us uh it's very paradoxical because when he he's uh he likes the liar's paradox you know i am lying but that's also a truth you know, it, it, it's, I'm saying in the, in the context that I'm lying, but I take myself into account as a truth. So there's a paradox of it, right? And and I think this is where it's like, here it's this is an early, early seminar, but in seminar 11, when he talks about the subject of enunciation versus the subject enunciated, um, we can see this play out on the level of like, who the other is that's speaking, right? And that's on the level of big O versus the subjective, what I said in the beginning of the my presentation, is subject as S, E, S. And this is where this subjective is structured by repression or by foreclosure. And so for uh, Schraber, anybody that comes into contact that resembles big O is going to, or just a psychotic is going to resemble a threat of castration, of taking something away, of robbing, of trying yeah. to cut you, trying to invade yourself. And so 
we never really get this sort of uh, play of signifiers and discourses because it's automatically rejected in the form of a ver verbal hallucination. Uh, versus... Even like the general thing he's saying already sounds delusional, you know? It's like, okay, in physics, no, in, in a whatever, in a sense... we have a world that works, it doesn't mean anything, but it is a whole. Well, Whereas here, it's it sounds like the world itself is trying to lie to us. I mean, it's the deceptive but, god. But yeah, I mean, if, let's go. Let Let's go back to you know my presentation and even my essay of the uh, the uh, the martyr of the unconscious, the discourse of freedom. There is a sort of collective delusion in which we don't know how this world came into be. But yet we're certain that we could know something or we could be free about something, but we're in a sort of resigned abandonment when we are put into question the nature of something like should one ought to be married or not or advice give you not because you know pretty much that we really uh, don't want to express our sort of ulterior motives or like our secret like moralizing thoughts about something, but that we don't even know ourselves. And so a scientist could do all they want with physics and stuff like that. But when you question them on science itself, what do they do but resort to sort of some naive philosophical speculation like, well, science doesn't know everything. We're learning something new. Today, we know a little. Tomorrow, we know more. And maybe we could, you know, one day solve the problem of world hunger or stop all wars, right? I mean, this is the sort of like foreclosure that science does or like, when we talk about, um, since I'm obsessed with like uh, uh, Lukash right now, Lukash's critique of irrationalism and uh, the neo-Kantian school, which was focused on scientific phenomenon and conditions of possibility of scientific knowledge, it inverted Kantianism from its like original like source of like epistemology and you know th its possibility of, of of knowing something that can be called metaphysics to scientific phenomenon, scientific knowledge. And the noumena had everything to do with social phenomenon and political phenomenon. So questions concerning concerning human freedom, uh, political freedom and justice were suspended, right? And so this gives them reign to be able to act in a react reactionary, uh, irrational way around something that cannot be known, but yet we still, in this world we call one, can collect all the facts, right? And that's so that's why he's giving this whole thing about like that number five and so on that basically like the limits of our yeah unifying system determine exactly that, that yeah that's really interesting you bring that up because um our our good friend comrade tut talks about this in his book on nietzsche which is really good how to read like a parasite i highly recommend it but he's talking about nominalism and irrationalism and how the Nietzscheans, those who really embrace that sort of ubermensch view of themselves as able to at least intuitively come into closer proximity to whatever this mystical noumenal other is, are elevating irrationalism to a kind of um privileged place where it's like if only the you know most refined man of genius is able to only like pro approximately intuit this other thing then the, the masses surely cannot and we for the masses we have only a nominalistic worldview right. to offer where there are only labels and names and they but they're in complete flux and we can't pin anything down exactly and you know what's funny about the nietzscheans because you know who's both a nietzschean and also the founder of discourse theory is foucault right mm, even yes foucault, yeah. even foucault isn't on the level of what lacan is doing with understanding discourse science knowledge and the other because all foucault could con conceive is an order of things in which we have a multiplicity of different discourses and we just have this power discourse that is hegemonic upon all these marginal things and so it's funny even in his thing you know he can't go beyond discourse in the way that Lacan does because he still ends up in a sort of form of mastery 
where his yeah. big other who plays the science for him is the marginal discourse. No, right? but think of it's 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 the madman, right? And it's, think about think about this though, it's just because it, it just occurred to me because we were talking about uh diachrony versus the synchronic synchrony. Foucault's idea is archaeology, and a Foucauldian who's reading Lacan for the first time when he talks about these historical shifts in the signifying system might just think, oh, right, that's archaeology right there. We just have these like layers of meanings and residues that are left over. But what they don't realize is that there's also the synchronic after effect where we get the illusion of a totality yeah. that ca is caused by this covariability within these shifts. So it's not just that it's like, no, you think are uh, you're experiencing synchrony, but what's really going on is diachrony that's in the real and diachrony is purely imaginary. It's like, no, they're it, it, it's one and the same. I don't know if I'm making sense. It's there, one and the but same, like, but for, for Foucault, you know, in, in his level of discourse, in his archaeology, he's doing a, 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 a a Nietzschean uh, genealogy. And so what he's privileging is a historical moment mm, in, right. in a romanticized form of uh, one where there is a, is a higher level of order versus a lower level of order. But even it's, beyond it, that, isn't like power as a concept something that he is not deconstructing? He's not, no. And, 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 and that- And he but, cannot say what it is. Yeah, that and the fact that he's even charged with the metaphysics of presence for madness. And, and what I'm saying is that he can't even get beyond like, you know, discourse in the way that Lacan is doing, uh, because even for him, who's playing, who's his big other? It is the marginal subject. It is the docile body that gives him all the signs that he needs. And that's what I'm saying. It's like, you know, for Foucault's like discovery of discourse analysis and or as you would call archaeology later, Foucauldians and the way like it simulates in the Anglo Anglophone uh, world is discourse analysis. And it tries to look at the power aspect, what's dominating. But no matter what, it's never really the sort of power person that's the subject supposed to know. It's the uh, it's the marginal one that feeds all the facts, that feeds all the signifiers for them. And yet, you know, they're still stuck in this sort of web of just like, oh, then we just need to find this pure difference or pure way of acting, which doesn't amount to anything but a Nietzschean way of affirmation and acting irrational, you know, to go to finally quote it to what you're talking about with Nietzsche, the Nietzscheans. Um, that's where like, really, I see like someone like Foucault, who's supposed to be like, well, anti psychiatry, you know, anti sort of like power discourse, but it's like, no, like, you didn't do anything, but just kind of like, you know, bring power back into like a different place. You know, you just let it out the, the front door and bring it back into the back door, right? <laughs> as actually powerful as your marginal subject, right? Right. And Lacan's historicism is a conceit. I like that Milner yeah. points this out. He says something really fascinating. If I recall it correctly, it's like basically Lacan's historicism when he's talking about, let's say, the four discourses or even the sort of allusions to history and freedom that he's making in earlier lectures. it That's Lacan's answer to Freud's sort of biologism. But he understands that it's misleading, but it's yeah. almost like intentionally misleading because Lacan is not trying to present anything like a Foucauldian archaeology with his his discourse theory, right? He's not trying to say that, okay, well, if the, the fifth discourse, like the capitalist discourse, is a historical phenomena, a phenomenon, and that what we had before, its antecedent was the master's discourse, which gave way to the university discourse. It's like these predominant discourses, and I think this is where we get synchrony and diachrony as one and the same. He's trying to really upset the linearity that we rely on for understanding, quote unquote, historical evolution. And you can see the same with uh, the idea that uh, 
there is the mere stage, right? Yeah, and it's I a think stage like two lectures before. Yeah, he said like, okay, I'm I'm making a mistake now, but I'm gonna talk about uh, it uh, genealogically, right? Yeah. Uh, forget that after I said that, <laughs> okay. And like in the last in the last seminar, I looked at the last seminar, which is really fun because he doesn't say almost anything. Like one lecture is like one sentence. He, he says over and over again, there is no change. Nothing changes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. And then he says, I'm so tired. I'm so confused. And he's like, and he lecture. also says, uh, it's such a sort of off the cuff remark but just says like oh my style is dialectical yeah my style he doesn't say dialectical <laughs> yeah. he it's very rare that he says yeah. it apparently yeah. in a in a slavoj lecture i was listening to slavoj says that i forget it's one of the later seminars where he does straight up call himself a dialectical materialist at one point yeah, yeah it's, it's funny the, how like what is it andrew i want to say it's in seminar 17 where he says that uh I'm, I'm a dialectical materialist i could be wrong but no he does say it i remember actually reading it one of the yeah same. um no and, and and honestly though like i mean there are some dialectical moments and i think this notion that he's dealing with the signifier of like contradiction and contrary is very hegelian when he's not being hegelian like when he doesn't say like talking about hegel you know i think he is and, and when he's saying dialectical i think he really is dialectical but when he's talking about hegel he's very kojevian and it's very reliant on knowledge truth and um you know the the servitude of the master slave and this is like not, he's not even doing archaeology or genealogy but like a sort of myth of origin of knowledge and discourse relies on this Kojevian approach of the master and servitude, which we have a production of knowledge based upon the slave, uh, and the master runs it. He's the he's the agent and speaker that starts it. But what does the master have? And, and that's the thing. Doesn't really have anything at all, but the sort of sense of jouissance, enjoyment. Right. And I don't know how the level of diachrony and synchrony really function here, but but, you know, back to what you were saying, Nick, about like the discourses, you know, there is this shift of mastery that happens between master discourse, which is supposed to be the fundamental underlying one. But it's not to say that that was the first discourse. Yeah, exactly. If you say the first discourse that really existed is always been the university discourse, but it's right. to conceal really what is underlying. It's mastery, mastery of the world, mastery of knowledge. But what is knowledge but a production, a truth production based upon wherever jouissance is situated, right? And it is through science, which is the production of the university discourse, that brings about the hysteric. That is what is unconscious about the scientific discourse when we talk about the subject in question. Because we always get, what is the object of science, right? But we never ask, what, what is, is the subject? Yeah. Yes, That's a great point. Science, that is a great point. Right? It's always the object and the objective of science, but never the subjective of science, right? Because the subject's for no, But what is the object? Yeah, it can only be something that is non-scientific, right? It's the universe, but then you already have like some kind of signifier. Yeah. Yeah, and so all the facts are supposed to metonymically take the place of the universe, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, and so this is what Lacan expo exposes with science and how... By a scientist who was our scientist freud who discovers psychoanalysis from anna o yeah. well you know you know what's interesting that it just occurred to me is that scientism would have it that okay let's say that the object of science is the universe and then after we've established hypothesis and experimentation evidence testing the evidence again and this entire process as our approach to the object then we can decide whether we want to reintroduce a god into the scheme we could jettison god altogether we could be new atheists we could be kind of like deistic about it. we could do whatever we want but what's interesting is that like what's not called into question is the technique itself so it's like the technique of science in its approach to the object is even more 
real and has like more validity for the believer in science than yeah. even the object itself in a sense yeah i mean this is just a stupid it's it's just a stupid material flat thing that just sits there waiting to be yeah investigated yeah it, it's evoked as soon as it's brought into question <laughs> you know it, it doesn't exist until you speak about it that's, the, that's then, the like what you're saying nick like perfectly reflects in in descartes i think like this oh. method of science which is like you just doubt everything all the time mm -hmm. kind of i mean that's what millionaire is saying this doubt is the scientific method and it it's um, kind of funny because it's like with yeah. the whole cartesian doubt this skepticism that he systematically applies to the universe it's as as, as if the the universe in this case and god himself is willing to wait in the lobby for him to <laughs> question everything <laughs> and then come back whereas yeah. like in an aristotelian universe god's not god as the prime mover i think isn't going to be that patient no. or god no. that the demiurge isn't going to take a back seat to yeah. well even in the, in, even in the platonic system demiurge is just a blind idiot you know because it's really not the one right yeah, yeah. You know? versus the prime mover of aristotle who's just a prime mover it has nothing to do with creation but it has to do with just a start right a beginning you know for uh you know first cause and then ultimately from the different causes we have a final cause right right but no history to it right that's the, that's the difference with aristotle right but i wanted to say like you can draw the differentiation that lacan is making here between physics and psychoanalysis by looking at Descartes, I think, because Descartes is, okay, he's doubting, 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 but then he is substantializing that doubt into, I think, therefore I am, then you have the cogito as something substantial that isn't any doubted anymore, whereas Lacan is saying, I think, therefore I am. Right? Yeah, and, and, and what... He's doubting this cogito also, that's... that's yeah. The, yeah, and what Lacan will always come back to Descartes, you know, as the sort of uh, proponent of like modern science versus like, you know, Bacon, who's always accredited with the scientific method, but it's really Descartes with the cogito and the doubt. But with Lacan say in seminar two, and then bring it back in seminar 11, is that Descartes doesn't go far enough because like he's only focused on the I think, but doesn't realize, you know, the function of language and that reflexivity goes beyond just the, uh, the thinking I. Even somebody like Sartre will even critique this notion of reflexivity and talk about yeah. the nihilation and 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 non the 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 nothingness annihilating of you know the the subject um and and it was the dialectic of like non being or whatever. But the the tan that was a tangent. The point is is that really he can't conceive of the level of the unconscious because he doesn't take language into account. You know in the way that freud would and so that's yeah, and he's relying on something that is outside of this doubt mm -hmm. just saying i'm doubting but i can make the statement that there is something that is doubting I, I, i'm completely like recounting the point of millionaire right uh, right and so as psychoanalysis would say no this subject is the subject of doubt but it's nothing substantial it's more the the absence of an outside and that's also what mm. they're saying about yeah. the modern universe that there is no beyond the universe anymore so everything and so it's like does subject to doubt and that means it's a non-all yeah and and so the question of descartes is interesting and enlightenment because let's go back to schreiber who lacan says is the product of the enlightenment and is able to prove god's existence you know <laughs> through all these different like rigmaroles that he, he does in his memoirs and it's like well you know we have all these different voices that seem to be intruding on him and whether they deceive him or not it's like well he doesn't question their you know validity really he could say maybe that they are deceiving but it's like does he really question the nature of its deception and that's the interesting thing about you know schraver as a psychotic with his delusions um it's that like he doesn't question the resigned abandonment he still continues to go he still you know believes that he's still certain that god wants him and only him right he doesn't question 
he is, if I'm not mistaken, he doesn't question that God may be deceiving him, right? It's the other voices that are these other extensions. Well, because there's two registers of language, though. Yeah. yeah. For Schraber, there's think about the way the neurotic experiences language. It's like every other word could potentially be deceiving, but for Schraber, there are like two streams basically. Yeah. And yeah. one is. Well, I guess empty and therefore deceiving, although I might be conflating them. And then the other one's super charged with meaning, but always broken off. It, yeah. So the, the empty one is like automatic. He's saying oh, like, yeah, yeah. it doesn't have any real meaning. It's just some like in these improvised men, they just get like some kind of computer program, just have to repeat a, a sentence. <laughs> they're, or something. Just, they're just NPCs. <laughs> yeah, whereas NPCs, the Grundsprache yeah, exactly. is like, yeah. I don't know luda and it has like all the meaning yeah <laughs> because he i mean he doesn't doubt that these things are happening to him yeah so he does the doubt. he's doing why he's like scientific in some sense is like he's trying to analyze it he's trying, yeah, he's trying to, to he's writing it understand down it, like work ex not understand it explain it right he's That's trying to explain it but yeah i said write it up he's trying to explain it but it is god as other that is writing it down and then it's the other also owe as blessing in this threat of castration that wants to murder his soul. And so there's where we get this sort of oscillation between extreme eroticization of the signifier and aggressivity. So, um, you know, Luder acts as this sort of impasse of confusion in the way that, like, Lacana will say, the stickleback when looks at his reflection in a beer bottle or something like that, um, versus, like, you know, Flessinge, who is always out to get him, right? He he is the sole murderer. He, he, you know, resembles the threat of castration. But God doesn't, right? It's only this whisper of Luder that brings this weird confusion because he's put in this sort of grandiose position where he's at least certain that God wants him. So in this moment where he gets almost to a close proximity, that this word triggers a weird effect that puts him in a sort of... um you know, deadlock. Well, not really that, but just sort of weird impasse of confusion like this took back. Because really the deadlock is in the form of resigned abandonment where he, um, you know, is uncertain about his freedom because of the question of God's knowledge of the future, right? Because that would imply that he knows everything about the mortal world. He doesn't, and he can't even predict the lottery. Yeah, he can't predict the lottery, but he can make it happen. He can make it happen, right? Yeah. You know, but just doesn't have the knowledge of it. It's just like, you know, the, the watchmaker that could, you know, make the gears turn on a watch, but doesn't know what happens really inside, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe like that, yeah. But like, yeah. maybe to get back to the scientific point, one interesting thing is that in the appendix of uh, Schreber's book, right, there's like a little section where he... Like compile the document to send to some uh, uh, a court while, where he tries to really like as if he has made some kind of fundamental discovery that will influence like the whole world and is a true revelation. Um, so the, he's like the revelation hundred percent happened, but why it is like it is that he's working on that, right? That's yeah, yeah. But this will this will solve the problem of all sciences and all us, you know. <laughs> You know, it's funny. It, you said that he wrote that to a court for like a yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's kind of funny. I think it was about him being released from the mental asylum, but I'm not hundred percent sure. You know, it's funny because that also makes me. But it was supposed to be scientific, like it was supposed yeah. to convince people, but it sounds completely crazy. <laughs> yeah, well, it's funny that like he wrote that and can try to 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 send it to like the like the court or like you know some legislative body because it's like Freud. And this comes from Etienne Balabar, used to be in um, dialogue with this, somebody of the Supreme Court in, in where he was living named Kessel about his theory of the superego. And apparently he did not like that because he thought it was so radical and it resembled a sort of radical theory that was associated with communism. So he had to like, you know, really water down and, and, and hide his theory of the superego. This comes from the citizen of the subject, and it's written by Etienne Balabar, one of the uh, Althusserian Marxists. And I just think it's interesting. It's like this association of like wanting to like, you know, send your ideas to like somebody who's like in the high legal status, 
<laughs> yeah. yeah, definitely. Yeah. I, I think we kind of also have to address the question of like psychosis in the ending of the this chapter, but I think what's interesting also is that there is no notion of the latter in this, right? There's only, like he says, the pure signifier, which I'm 100% sure, as you guys also said, will later on become the latter, basically. Well, pretty um, much but... like a, a pure signifier comes comprised of letters, which are phonemic and morphemic, if I'm using that correctly, Nick. But yeah, like the, these letters are, are pretty much utterances that when repeated, in numerous occasions can combine into a form of a pure signifier and so that's the, that's the, the sort of the, the difference is that like well you know with the covariance and variability stuff we don't just have to think on the level of signifier but also on the level of letters you know like a game of scrabble can somehow when you have a bunch of letters right there and you have enough spaces you can combine a word and make a word happen right but in psychoanalysis it's not about a word full of meaning it's about a word that is so like punctual because it's so pure and you know the patient can't you know respond in a significant sense as nick brought up earlier yeah but i mean like a math theme for example is is a le is letter oh, yeah it's, it's pure yeah, yeah it's, it's pure like letter. The, yeah. the formula then, in physics yeah. it's letter it's not yeah a signifier later on but it's, here's it's pure, signifier. Yeah. It, it, and and yeah. where it becomes a signifier is that you have to uh attach other signifiers to it to yeah, give yeah. it meaning right yeah, yeah. not that the signifier is a meaning making machine meaning is only the other aspect of the writing down in which other signifiers relate to the other signifiers yeah yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. it's like yeah. yeah yeah you're right but i i wanted to ask like okay so he's kind of defining the signifier as uh you have a sign <laughs> and then you note down the sign yeah this noting down becomes a signifier because of the absence of another <laughs> sign kind yeah. of like that trying to say like that a physic a, a, a formula in physics is also such a noting down no, because no, that doesn't thing, make sense to me you know because i'm thinking no okay, the thing he's is what he's saying is too. that physics tries to rely on a sort of natural phenomenon in which that case there's no one that writes down any sort of signifier right there's no one signifying in the natural phenomenon so it's really on the level of the the subject in question which is the physicist that's doing that and so where the signifier and the writing down comes in is with these um physical these physics equations which really don't mean anything until they use the word natural phenomenon and plug and play natural phenomenon meaning, which can be just a language discourse into pure writing, which is mathematical and how that relates to it, whether it be, you know, the law of gravitation, uh, the law of thermodynamics, uh, you know, E equals MC square, time and relativity, all that. That is where I think Lacan is trying to show really the level in which physics is operating on a writing down system right then that's, it's really embedded that's in milner that. i mean that's what milner is saying and he's saying that the difference yeah. between yeah. what we have with the number in the ancient world which is in a sense let's say inert and stable and of which necessary it's it's necessary necessary right necessary yeah. absolutely <laughs> necessary and the appearances that we encounter are in a sense like approximations of it but through geometry and what does it say above plato's academy i got this from daniel tutt recently quoted it like those who have not studied geometry, geometry yeah, are not, should not enter yeah, yes. should not like, yeah like basically that and the idea is that yes mathematics is the portal into the one which is the good, which is beautiful, which is truth, and that it's fixed and it's yeah. staying where it is. And innovation, of course, is the greatest of evils in that sense. Yeah. But with the introduction of the contingency of the letter as the vehicle for the mathematizability of the world, 
what we get is the contingency of the letter, which, yes, retroactively becomes necessary, but always introduces the possibility, and this is what we've been getting at, mm -hmm. that things can be otherwise than they yeah. are. And then that makes me think with his criticism in, in, in the beginning of the seminar of Jung, right, is that it's like, well, what was esoteric for them in, in ancient antiquity is now public, right? And Jung fetishizes that while also being a man of the enlightenment and tries to, you know, do the uh, Burma take of, of uh, inscribing, you know, signifying something to it in a sort of like way where it's like, well, this this thing corresponds. This symbol really corresponds to this. It's like there's sort of mystical meaning to mm. it, not in the way that because he's obsessed with different religions and you know different myths. It's the fact that his notion of symbols are in themselves mystical because they hold a hidden meaning to them. You know, he's treating um, signifiers as hieroglyphics, mm. and so you know he he wants to be a man of the Enlightenment but then also romanticize antiquity with their notion of like geometry and all the way that they have, you know, they understood myth, mathematics, and the cosmos. And so I, I mean, Jung is really a little bit like Egyptian uh, um, dream interpretation. Yeah. Have, like, okay, you have this image, uh, it means that. Maybe, yeah. I don't know anything about Jung, but I just... <laughs> well, no, yeah, yeah, because it's like, you know, know, pretty much like what they do is that they, you know, in 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 their theory of like dream symbols, it's that what they ascribe to is a comp a meaning of complex, and so like seeing like you know a cat means this rather than seeing the logic of the dream yeah. that it structures, in how we see Freud's dream of Urban's injection of how we get you know the the side of the scene where Freud is, I guess he's at like at a cafe or something, or like, like at a sort of like, you know, dining theater. And then, kind of Irma, gathering. Okay. yeah, and then like Irma's there complaining about her pain in her throat as he looks in the throat and he sees the sores and just something that's unsignifiable. And then the three men like Otto and the other two, like, you know, the other two guys bickering about what the problem is. And really the conclusion of the dream is where we see the formula introduced of trimethylamine. And so this feedback retroactively is really what sparks the side of the dream is the signifier in the letter, which lets the dreamer play its defense. The, the subject of the dream is able to play the defense by intermixing different eyes, yeah. different egos. In seminar two, he calls it his alter egos. So it's not just Freud, you know, the scientist, it's also Freud taking on projections of uh, Otto and you know his revenge fantasy of trying to put the blame on Otto of you know giving her dysentery or the other two that he did not like as well and so this really is a way in which imaginarily you know is a sort of defense to you know disguise what's really the motive of the dream and it is the the chemical compound just like in the purloined letter it's the letter which is the cause of the dream it's um right it's it's just like what i forget the the name of the the film term uh, a mcgruff it's a mcgruff you know just like uh, mcguffin mcguffin a mcguffin yeah just yeah. like in the suitcase in a uh, pulp fiction you know it's exactly yeah. what this is because it's that's like it it's like uh you know at the end of the dream what is the sort of irreducible indestructible correlate almost of the subject himself it's that the jawbreaker of trimethylamine mm -hmm. right it's not so much the signified of it although it does have a kind of signified but that's not even what we're looking for what's behind it right this is what Lacan's saying it's the signifier itself as mm -hmm. such mm -hmm. which kind of rears its head at the end of this dream that's what what Freud was looking for, but didn't realize, you know. And you through, wouldn't, like, you wouldn't, proximity, uh, 
yeah. everything has like the, the impossibility has been displaced onto this formula kind of and it takes the place of what we were saying before right with this it's that line that i forget yeah. what slavoy is quoting but um what does he say you wouldn't be looking for me if you hadn't already found me <laughs> yeah. yeah 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 and we, there it like, is. This dream is so David Lynch, like the saws. And oh the, my gosh! And the is it? Isn't it ever? This yeah. Formula, like we really need to contact him. And <laughs> I think he might have directed Bridge Dream. I... Yeah, I mean it's the, <laughs> avant la lettre, right? <laughs> True. No, but I wanted to like I tried to highlight that there is I think there is a difference between that pure signifier in physics and what's happening on the boat. Right, because probably and probably the difference is when I'm on the boat, I'm the captain, I see the sign, I note it down. Yeah. But I know there is someone signing, but someone signing who could also deceive me. Whereas in physics, there's no one making a sign. It's just that's why I'm I'm always thinking. Well, yeah, yeah, because he's cause it's... the wrong word. Yeah, well, what, what, well, it's the fact that it's like, yeah, like, uh, there's no, there's no one signifying in nature, right? Yeah. Versus the captain, you know, rather than like, what do you say? If I'm not a human, then I would react in such and such way. If I am, then I note down the time, the latitude, and log longitude, and you know, place that I'm at. But it, it's not to gain any meaning, right? It's just to write down simply and that's it's like that's what it's funny because that's what the navy really does or just like any sort of naval vessel they always just they're not really trying to um gain knowledge of what they are they're just simply they're just simply trying to jot things down onto a log there's always a log and i find it funny because it's like i was thinking of it it's like well whenever there's like some type of extreme casualty like um a fire on the ship or like uh the main reduction gear which is responsible for like giving torque to the engines if something were to like happen in that where that malfunctions ncis comes on board the first thing that they do is not go into the space where you know the cause of the thing happened they go to the logs they go to the quarter deck and they're like was this thing logged down they go to the central console control station where the engineering control is at was this logged down so that determines everything it's like was it written down right and if it wasn't written down, well, the person that didn't get didn't write it down is also getting in trouble. If some person was also destroying property, yeah, they're gonna get in trouble too. But this person didn't write it down, and the person upstairs who was also on watch didn't write that down. You guys are getting it worse, right? But if it was written down, okay, you know that's fine. We we realize that it's legally written down, and so like I find that like is the most like funny thing ever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I, I need to eat dinner and. <laughs> Get ready for bed soon. Yeah. Any, any final uh, final comments? No, no. I think we covered it all pretty much. Yeah. 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 All right. I we still have some questions on. about psychosis, but yeah. I mean, this, is, this is why we're doing we're doing this entire seminar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, psychosis. Yeah, psychosis. Oral. Yep. Okay. Well, that concludes it. All right, y'all. Until next time. Peace. Peace.